let's get started. Uh, so today is pretty simple. We're going to be talking about case writing, general debate strategy, and kind of winning debates in prep. This is going to be more of a kind of overview presentation, so it's going to introduce you to all of my ideas. I'll give examples of topics, etc., where they kind of come up in my mind as we talk through. But obviously, uh, this is more of a general strategy you can apply to lots of different kinds of debates, rather than how to do kind of specific types of motion. So this isn't going to get into, for example, how would we create a strategy in a regret debate versus like a norms debate. That's probably something you want more specific seminars for. Uh, otherwise, obviously, if you have any questions, or if you want me to send you the slides afterwards, I'm more than happy to. Uh, otherwise, let's kind of get straight into it. So we're broadly going to look at two things today. The first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at kind of what actually makes a good case in theory. So what are the types of things that people run that win them debates? And then secondly, we're going to look at, well, how is a team? Do we actually construct those good cases? How do we make them work? And I'll send some tips and give my thoughts as well uh, throughout that. Cool. Uh, firstly, we're going to look at an overview of kind of what case writing is. Uh, so especially for those of you who are new to debating, you might not have heard the expression of what case writing is before, or if you didn't get a huge amount of coaching if you had done it before in places like high school. Broadly, the thing to keep in mind, case writing is the collective sum of material your team claims in the debate. So it is just like everything, basically. Uh, but in particular, I think there are three broad components of it. And you just want to think about it as these are kind of individual lines of analysis pieced together into a kind of whole. So yes, when we make an argument or give a rebuttal, those are all individual lines. But the case is how those things all interact together and how it feeds into a wider whole. Broadly, there's three components. Uh, the first is just our arguments, so the constructive or the substantive that we run in the debate. That is probably the most important part of any good case for the very simple reason that you can't really win debates if you don't give arguments that are going to persuade judges that you should win the debate, particularly given there are, is another team in the room also making arguments and also doing things. So that's the primary vehicle by which any case functions. Do you have good arguments? Do you defend those arguments well throughout the debate? Do they make sense? Do they prove things? Are they persuasive? All of that kind of stuff. The second thing then is deconstructive, which is just rebuttal. So this is the claims that you levy at the opposition team. So this is how does your case interact with their case, and in particular, how your case engages with the other team, and what kind of from that clash is remained standing. Because you might have a case that in theory sounds really, really good, but if all of your best arguments just get like rebutted to the moon and they don't stand at the end of the debate, you can't actually win off those things because the judge isn't going to believe them anymore. So deconstructive to the extent you attack the other team's case but also protect your own is really, really important. And the final thing is meta-commentary. If you're newer to debating, I would suggest you think about this component a little bit less, but especially if you do have some experience already, this is probably the thing that I would suggest makes the biggest difference in high-level debating, the types of things that you see in international competitions, in terms of who's going to win and why. And this is all basically the strategy of how do you position different material, what things in the debate do you focus on given how much stuff there is, and what types of things you prioritize. Broadly, that looks like two things. Framing, which basically, Framing is very confusing, people use it in lots of different ways and are not necessarily always clear what it means. The way I conceptualize framing is imagine it is quite literally, uh, before you is like a painting and it is the entire amount of stuff that's in the debate. And the framing is literally just like you're cropping a photo, what you move around and what is and is not within the view of what you want the debate to be about. So it's all about how do we move that frame to the parts of the debate that look the best for our case. Like maybe everything else looks crap, but if we focus on the one part that's really, really good for our side, that obviously you can see how might be enormously beneficial. And then Wayne, that's probably a bit simpler. That's just why the things that you're proving in either your arguments or in your rebuttal, why those things are important, why should we care about them, why are they significant enough that someone should agree that the thing you're arguing for is particularly good. The other thing I want to note though, is I think especially in high school, uh, especially at lower levels of debating, lots of people have the conception that the case is static. So the things that you come up with in prep and the arguments you run do not really change a lot over the course of the debate. I would suggest this is a bad way of debating and also is just going to mean you lose lots of debates. The reality is, cases aren't static, and they evolve over time. That's both because they're being compared against something else, and so if you want to win the comparison with the opposition's team, your case necessarily needs to evolve and change, depending on what the other team says, in ways that are going to overcome or hopefully beat out that other version of the case. Uh, but also, generally speaking, uh, 
or what comes out in one speech is not the full breadth of thoughts you had in the prep, or indeed the full use of your speaking time. So you've got two extra speeches after the first speech. The case should develop, it should get more nuanced, more complicated and sophisticated, just because you spend longer talking about it in the first instance. And a lot of the skill of case writing is how can we make these cases stronger from the start, but also how can we continue to develop them over the course of the debate so they become particularly powerful and how we make them particularly persuasive. I would note the skill of case writing is incredibly important, and this is something that especially if you're like me, or if you like speaking responsive, or you just think coming up with ideas is really hard, but like writing cases in prep is kind of boring, it's more fun to wing it in debates. The reality is though like 90% of debates are won or lost in prep, because usually uh, the better and more cohesive set of ideas you have before you get into the debate, uh, that's probably going to continue to be the case within the debate as well. For the, I think, incredibly simple reason that the majority of thinking you do is probably going to be in a half an hour concentrated period, not in the hour afterwards where people are yelling things at you and plenty of words going back and forth. And it's really hard to think about things in the same kind of intellectual manner than you otherwise would be able to prior. So, to that extent, especially if you're someone who's finding anything with a ceiling in debating, or if you just kind of want to get better in general, case writing kind of isn't a skill you can ignore. Lots of people, I think, do ignore it as a skill, and then run into the problem when they start hitting a ceiling at some point, when they're wondering why they can't get better. And the answer is, it's probably just because the cases that you're writing just aren't as good as the more experienced debaters, even if you might have more tactical skill than them. If they've just got better ideas, they'll be able to beat you out more often than not, and so it is a really important part of getting better as a debater as well. Cool. We're going to look at the two things that make a good case. And firstly, we're going to start by looking at the big picture, like what are the overall notions and features of a case that is persuasive and effective, and then we'll look at what are the smaller stuff you do need to do right for that to make sense. Uh, the first thing is that your case just has to be derived from the motion, and this sounds really simple, but I, don't, I think a lot of people mess it up. The best cases are the ones that really analyse and understand what the words of a topic actually mean. Thinking about, for example, what is the burden that the topic is actually implying? What tools do you have to avail to solve that? What are the different moving pieces of the motion? And so the parts that we're going to have to focus on where the change happens. Really easy examples of this is stuff like, if a debate is like that we should, um, uh, that we should never use the death penalty, in that debate, the burden of your, a negative team isn't that the death penalty is good, it's just that there may be a very small set of instances where the death penalty would be good, and so to say we could never use it is a really bad idea. Compare that to say if the debate is just we should not use, like the death penalty is bad, that's obviously very different because that's talking about the majority of cases as opposed to a minority of cases. And so doing things like picking apart the wording of the topic to understand what it is you need to do aren't really useful skills to making good cases, in large part just because they make your life easier, but also they tell you what are the weak points of your case likely to be and the things you really need to make sure work. So that's what we mean when we're referring to burdens, and how do you make sure those things can be used effectively. Also just fear in that, so if it's like a policy debate, you've got modeling power, it's often useful to think about how to use that power in ways that are advantageous. Very commonly, uh, in debates where you've got a really strong amount of modeling power, uh, using that really effectively and very intentionally is very good. Uh, Isaac is not in the room. Oh, yes, no, they are, never mind. Uh, but Isaac would remember, in one of our Austral's debates, we had the motion that we would, uh, the government should financially subsidize acts of friendship. And the way we were able to do really well on that debate is we used our modeling power to very explicitly set up what those financial incentives looked like. And we were basically like, this is the dine and discover vouchers. And that really blindsided the team who assumed we were going to do cash-based subsidies and who had made most of their arguments around that. But because that's not what we did, and we had a substantial amount of power to say we could do it in the way we envisioned, we got a really early lead in the debate that meant we were able to carry it through the whole way around. And that was pretty consistent with other stories I've heard of how that round went for other teams as well. So thinking about how you can use the tools the motion gives you effectively is really, really important. Uh, the second thing is just to have multiple win strategies. And there's a future slide that will talk a little bit more about what win strategies are in more detail and what makes them good. But to be very clear, a win strategy is just what are the ways that your team is capable of winning the debate. And that is something that is helpful to know in prep and have a clear idea of, because kind of like any game, right, if you've been out like board games or whatever, it's way easy to play the board game if you know how to win the game. And I think people forget that debating, yes, it's a sport, or like a competitive activity, I guess, whatever you want to call it, but at the end, it's a game, and it's an intellectual game. And so having ideas about what the goalposts are for you to hit to win that game make your life substantially easier, because you can back plan everything from that to be like, well, if doing this thing or proving this thing is how I win, then you've just got to think about the steps you take to get there, and it makes you a lot more, have a lot more direction than you otherwise would with a particular domain. I'll note the things that make a good case in particular are that not only you have multiple win strategies, you've got many different ways you can win the debate, generally two or three being realistic, 
uh, but also that those are clear. So they're clear within your team, every speaker on your team understands what those are, but they're also clear to a judge. So a judge can understand what the things are going to like make you win the debate and understand whether or not you're successful in that. Broadly, within win strategies as well, there's two useful features to note about them. The first is that each win strategy should be independent and centered on different components of the debate. And what I mean by that is really simple. It doesn't matter if you have three win strategies if they're all reliant on like the same fundamental piece of analysis. Like if the debate is like that we should ban selective schools, and I have three different ways of proving the debate, but they all rely on me believing that selective schools are bad in the first place, if the other team just nukes that and spends all their time proving why selective schools are good, then it doesn't matter, right? Like I had multiple win strategies, but they all fall down to the same attack, so it's kind of useless. So we want our win strategies and the kind of pathways we have in the debate to be different from each other. So if one of them gets compromised, there are still other ways we can win the debate. So that's not going to be a problem. So it's like, obviously it's always easy to be like, well, if there's three clashes in the debate, if we can only win one clash, but then we explain why that one clash is enough to win the debate, we don't have to worry about winning all three. It's obviously way easier to win one than three. The other thing is that your uh, win strategy should be impact centric. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. But the key thing to note here is just like, the way you win debates is by proving harms and benefits. And so to the extent you're trying to push for a particular final end point in a debate, that should always be based around what actually happens to like people in institutions. How do people benefit or how do people are harmed? Yes, this is an intellectual activity, but I also think it is an emotional one to the extent that like we fundamentally just care about like the lives of people and whether or not they get better or whether or not they get worse. And almost any type of debate in some way boils down to that central idea. So keeping sight of that and remembering that I think is probably the thing that has most cases being particularly powerful. The third thing then that makes a good case is just framing the case strategically. This just looks like identifying the context in debate where you're winning and making the matter. I mean, this is the thing I talked about earlier with framing. It's like moving the frame of the debate so it focuses on the things that are most advantageous to you. And what's a high level debating? Both teams are going to argue about where this frame should be and kind of wherever it ends up settling has a large determination of the result. So cases that are using that framing very effectively often do very, very well. Uh, the fourth thing then is to be consistently comparative. And for those of you who don't know what comparative means, that's basically just like a good case should always be very explicitly comparing what your team's world and the opposition's team's world. So rather than just talking about why your world is good, you want to be saying why is your world better than the opposition's. And that's partly because that's how debating is judged. It's a game between two teams. And so it doesn't matter if you prove something is good in a vacuum, if the other team proves their thing is better in that vacuum than your thing is. And so ideally all your analysis is fixated around not just is this good, but is this better than what the other team in this debate is going to have to say. And importantly, doing that in not just individual arguments, but throughout a whole case is really, really important. So one really common mistake that a lot of early debates make will have be something along the lines of, you'll be doing a debate and you'll be like, Argument one, why is X good? Or argument two, why is Y bad? So for example, it might be like, uh, let's say it's a debate about whether or not we should subsidize electric cars or we should instead encourage people to purchase secondhand cars. Um, argument one, why buying electric cars is good. Argument two, why buying secondhand cars is bad. Does anyone see what the problem with that might be? It's not explicitly comparing those two things at all, right? So maybe it's true that electric cars are good but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the case that it's better than the alternative option, right? The analysis is just too stretched far apart. It's hard to compare it very explicitly what the other team is running. So a way better way of doing that would instead be structuring it along very specifically, why is X better than Y for A reason, or why is X better than Y for B reason? So that might look instead picking specific axes of the debate and explaining why one option is better than another in that world. So that would look something from saying why electric, why buying electric cars is better than uh, second-hand cars in terms of environmental impact. Explaining why specifically on that issue one of those options is better than the other. And the second one might be why are people more likely to buy electric cars and more willing to buy electric cars than they are to buy second-hand cars. So again, uptake would be the second question there. So rather than just in general saying thing good, thing bad, it's Here's why thing is better at this thing, and here's why it's better than this thing. That's a feature of very strong cases. It's often a very easy thing to do, because it's a habit you can very quickly catch yourself and prep and fix it, but it's really important to make sure you do it. Uh, the last thing is just to note, uh, the other thing is just being preemptive as well when I need comparative. So obviously if you're a speak like second or third, you give rebuttal, it's very easy to directly compare yourself to the other team, because you've heard what the other team's gonna say. But even at first, you should keep in mind what you think the other team is gonna run, and try and plan accordingly. So if you can, know that they're going to make a certain line of response and you can, for example, prepare your case for that before they've spoken, that's always going to be really helpful. 
The final thing is just to be charitable. And this just is like very simple. Take the opposition their best, don't lie about what they say, assume that they say things that are like in a good way, and then respond to the good version of the things they say and not the bad version of things they say. Obviously that means that you're more likely to win, you're you know being nicer, and also you're just kind of doing better debating generally. Part of this is also risk hedging. And what I mean by this is, partly similar to having multiple win strategies, you don't just want one way to win the debate, because then if that collapses, you're screwed. So you want to have multiple different insurances where if one thing doesn't work, like this is a claim that you can't prove in a debate, you've got other things you can do as well that can be helpful. Broadly speaking, that's a lot of thoughts. To sum that all up, it's very simply being clear in what your case is trying to prove and have a map a very clear path to that destination and make sure that the judge will see your case as relevant to the motion, so it's going to be very directly fixed on the side you have to defend. That's true, so you've been able to prove it. And you've also been able to prove that the things you're proving are actually important in the first instance. If the judge leaves a debate with those two things and they understand very well, even if you lose, you've done a very, very good case and that's something that you should be pretty happy of. So that's a good mental checklist to have in terms of what your actual intention is. Cool. Then there's just the details. This is a bit smaller. I'm going to rush through this a bit more because I think these are more kind of obvious, but they're useful to know. Firstly, your analysis should be robustly proven. The ideas you mention in your speech, I should understand why they are true. If you do not prove why the things you say are true, unclear whether or not I believe them. Maybe they're plausible, but if it's plausible but the other team is more plausible, that's not helpful. So you want to explain why the things in your case are actually true. And the easy thing to note here, the most contested claims are the ones that need the most proof. So the more teams are going to fight over something in the debate, and that's often very easy to see early, uh, that means the more time you're going to want to spend explaining why that thing is true, because the opposition presumably will spend more time responding to it. And that's often helpful in prep because you can prioritise a bit. If you know the other team is going to disagree with something, spend more time thinking about how you're going to prove that thing than things the other team might not care about as much. So for example, in that debate I mentioned earlier about like electric cars versus buying second hand, Teams are not going to disagree about whether or not climate change is bad. Both teams will probably agree with that. So you don't need to spend a lot of time proving why climate change is true or why we need to act quickly. But you probably should spend a lot of time proving something like which of them is better for the environmental impact or just like which of them is more within the reach of consumers or how do they already feel about these two things. Those claims will be more contested. Spend more time proving them. Uh, secondly, is just your analysis should be specific. So especially in impacts, a really common problem I see often in high school is kids will be like, this is bad because it's corrupt, or this is bad because it would be unfair, or this is bad because it would hurt people. What do those things mean? The problem is, if your analysis is really vague, it's really hard to judge, right? Because like, what am I actually judging? It's really unclear. The more specific you can be in terms of like, and it doesn't have to be like, people would lose $500, but explaining like, people would lose their jobs because of this and really struggle to get employed, that's a lot more tangible, that's much easier for judges to understand. And also, the more tangible the end goal you're going for, the easier it is for you to prove. Like, it's really hard to prove something that's vague and speculative. It's very easy to prove something if you're going for a very particular kind of tangible outcome. So, why specifically are the things you're proving actually good or bad? Explain why that's the case. Thirdly, you should just ground your analysis within reality. This is fairly straightforward. Debates are about the world. People sometimes forget that, but it's true. And so, you should make sure they're about the world and they're useful within the world. Ah, and that really simply is just like making sure things aren't too theoretical, you bring them back down to reality, make sure it's clear how they actually operate. Cool. One useful thing to know about examples, and even if you don't take away a huge amount else in this presentation because it's a bit above your head, this is really helpful to know. Examples in debating are really bad at proving arguments. And the reason why they're bad examples about proving why things are true is because every example is usually a counterexample. So often it's the case that, well, maybe it might be true in some cases, but not all cases. And that's why judges will often say, don't use examples to prove arguments. However, that doesn't mean examples are useless in debating. And where examples are the most effective is in explicating the things that you're proving and making it really clear what they actually look like. So maybe I shouldn't use an example to prove an argument about why people are more likely to buy an electric car, but I absolutely could use that as an analogy to explain why then going and buying that electric car is really useful and the things that would kind of do within the debate more broadly. The last thing I've already talked about, be adaptable throughout the debate, uh, prioritize things, engage with the other team, that's obviously important. Broadly, there's a little analysis checklist here of things that a good case should have. It's just kind of all the big debating buzzwords. Have some framing, explain what the status quo looks like and who's affected by the debate, why are things true, what are the consequences of those things being true, why are those things that important. You can explain all those words later if you're confused by any of them. Look at it, but most people, probably, especially if you've more debating, should probably already know what all those words mean. Oh, whoops, cool. Finally, let's talk about that win strategy thing I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, the thing to note here is just really simple. It's your plan for winning debate. Uh, and the way to think about, well, what's my plan for winning debate? It's a premise or a claim that if you successfully prove it, it would be basically impossible for the judge to give you a loss. You'd almost have to win the debate. And broadly, there's two ways you can do this. The first is through claims that are kind of independent, or the second through those that are comparative. So when I wrote an independent win strategy, uh, this is basically, if you prove it, irrespective of anything else the other team could possibly say, you have to win the debate. So this would be in a debate about, for example, regulating AI. If you prove that if we don't regulate AI now, we will lead to the end of the world, uh, it doesn't really matter what else the other team proves, right? It's such a big harm, or such a, alternatively in a different example, such a big benefit, that you just have to win the debate on that basis. These are awesome if you can find them, worth spending time on, but they are relatively rare to the extent that just not a huge amount of them. And also, the larger an impact is, generally the harder it is to prove. So most of the win conditions you have can be comparative. So this is like, for example, if we can prove that one thing is better than the way the other team suggests to do it. So for example, in that cars debate, if we prove that our strategy is a more effective way of solving climate change, that's probably a win condition debate. It's very hard at that point. If you prove relative to the opposition that's true, that you can lose it. And obviously, you're going to argue those things a bit differently. If it's independent, it's just about how well do you prove the thing. Where it's imperative, you've got to make sure you've proven it better than the other team. So the way you're going to carry out those strategies is a bit different, but it's good to know. Uh, the second thing is, as I said earlier, a win strategy is always based around impacts if it's a practical argument. So all your practical arguments, so each piece of sand is, should be structured around proving a claim that fulfills a win condition. So don't think of arguments as just things you run of, like reasons why a thing is good or bad. Think about arguments as in, if this argument is true, it's very hard for us not to win the debate. And that's how you should go to thinking about it. So that argument should be proving a really clear benefit, or it should be proving a really clear harm. Uh, the other type of thing, and I know this is a lot rarer, but is useful, is when there's an overwhelming non-contingent principle justification. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on principles because these are rare, but just put it in summary. This is if you prove there is an overwhelming moral reason, irrespective of any practical outcome, as to why you shouldn't do a particular thing. So if you prove that something, for example, would be such a grievous violation of someone's dignity that we would never remotely consider it, maybe that would be an independent win content debate. Those exist, but they're a bit rare. Helpful to know they exist, though. Again, as I said earlier, win content should be diverse and non-contingent. Uh, you should also just be clear importantly with your, I guess with your arguments as well as with the kind of win conditions they're trying to prove. Be clear, not just what the argument is proving in terms of what the win con is, but why that condition is actually something that wins you the debate in the first place. Teams are often unclear about this. Be clear why that thing wins you the debate. Like obviously, if you prove it, fantastic, but if judge doesn't know it wins you the debate, it's not gonna do you a lot of good in the long run. So it's probably important to explain that. The last thing that I wanna note about win strategies, being the kind of central fixed point of case writing, is that Every speaker on the team should have clarity about what the win conditions are uh, because it's not just the first speaker who's going to make them. Those win conditions might change or adapt according to the debate, but they broadly remain relatively similar unless if you've like royally cooked it. And so you need to make sure you're able to defend and pursue those win conditions as best you can down the bench in terms of what material do I prioritize? How should I structure my speech? And those are all things that rely on everyone in prep understanding what your team is doing and why you're doing it. It's obviously why talking to your teammates, making sure everyone knows and agrees on what's happening in the debate is super, super important in order to do well. Cool. That's all the theory of case writing. Does anyone have any questions at all? I don't care like how basic whatever they might be about anything I've just said. Yes. So like with independent like Yep. It'd be, it'd be more risky to do them as well because, like, if they get this version, then that whole argument goes. Yeah, absolutely. So, the problem with spending two, like, it's kind of a double burden, right? So, it's like, with, so the question for the audio is like, are in, like, independent win conditions are kind of more risky than comparative ones? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the reason for that is obviously, as I said, because an independent win condition is very high impact usually, so I have a big harm or big benefit, and tends to be very hard to prove, it tends to be you need to spend more time of your, like more physical time speaking about that thing to prove that it's true. But yeah, as you say, the problem with that then becomes, well, if it's disproven, then you wasted it. And so there is a bit of a sweet spot whenever you're running goes between spending enough time on it so you actually made it a win strategy that could work in the debate, 
but also not so much that if, for example, a judge doesn't believe it is intuitively true, that you have other options available to you. So yeah, absolutely, you wanna be, I would never really suggest having more than one of those maybe in a case, and it should probably be something that you've got other, you mix it with other types of, I'd say, fairly, like, substantially more certain arguments. So maybe there's a couple, like, free kick arguments in the name. Like, for example, if you know that we should make university education free, maybe you could just make a really radical claim about how in the developing world this should eradicate poverty. That's probably quite hard to prove, but then you can just get a guaranteed benefit of a set of people can now access education free and end up debt haunting over their lives. That's probably much easier to prove, and probably is very, like, that's probably not something the other team can really deal with. And so having a diverse range of proof behind each win condition, I think is relatively helpful there as well. But yeah, excellent question. Yep. Um, one on win strategies, I, I've struggled with this in a bit, and I've seen a lot of other novices and school kids struggle with it, is coming up with them and the intersection that win strategies have with arguments. If I write a speech, I've got three arguments at first, I think I'm going to win the debate. But then like, but are those three all win strategies? How do they intersect? How do you come up with them? I find that part can be a bit confusing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and also there's a few components there. I would say my general advice in terms of coming up with win strategies is thinking of kind of the biggest harms and benefits that you can within the debate. Uh, and when I say biggest, I don't just mean in terms of uh, the most intense or affecting the most people. So there's kind of a different discussion here that we might get into if we have time about weighing metrics. So the different reasons we would consider something to be important. But broadly, things can be important in numerous ways. Maybe something's important because we have a particular moral obligation towards doing that thing. Maybe something's important because the group involved is particularly vulnerable. Maybe something's important because it just affects people for a long people of time, even doesn't affect a huge number of people. Uh, those are all useful ways of thinking about. There are many different ways that can be important. So if the arguments you're thinking in the debate could reasonably be proven to be important, that probably suggests that it's really good grounds for a win strategy. But I think the other thing is just like actually being honest with yourself as well as I think a lot of it. I think a lot of time teams will think they have a win condition, but a lot of it's because they're not willing to kind of check or critique their own thoughts and prep. And if you were to actually think about it from a more neutral perspective, you'd realize that argument probably isn't as good as you think it is. So I think a lot of it is being honest. What actually can win you debate and what can't? And to be fair, that is not an insult on you as a case writer. That in fact is really important. Some debates do only have one win condition. And so in that sense, you want to think about different ways you could go about doing that thing, or if this doesn't entirely work, what are the other things we're gonna to need to do, even if they're just making sure we mitigate everything else the opposition has, so they have very little to be impaired against us. Uh, those type of strategic choices can only happen when you're honest, uh, so I would suggest that those things are probably also something to keep in mind. Uh, was that all for the question? I think so, yeah. Great, yeah. Yep. So statistics and data, my answer would be no. And the reason for that is just the way debating works. So because in a prep room you can't access the internet, um, it's kind of impossible to tell, like, is that actually a real stat or have you just made it up? So I think my advice would be, if you do know a stat, don't make up stats for one that's not gonna help convince anyone that it's true. But if you do know a stat and you think it actually illustrates your point really well, you can still give the statistic, but I would make sure you immediately follow up by proving a bunch of logical or structural reasons as to why that thing is true. So if you're, for example, and it can be really persuasive, you have to be like, like 99% of the uh, indigenous, like uh, the North, incarcerated population of the Northern Territory are indigenous, for example. Don't just drop that and just assume that other, the judgments are true. Be like, this is because, one, these communities are systemically over-policed for X, Y, Z reason. Secondly, these children often have very few support networks, so crime is one of the only things they can turn to. Ex doing it like that, uh, then the statistic kind of becomes clearer. But in that regard, there's kind of no difference from just saying that here is the specific stat, or just making the claim that almost all Indigenous Australians are uh, youth, are the people who are in like Northern Territory detention centres. So it's like, you could phrase the stat or not, it's kind of the same either way, but you, the way to make it work is giving those logical reasons. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Uh, the last thing that I forgot to mention here uh, about win strategies, is it on this slide? Ah. It is not, but the one thing I will note here that's useful, because I've forgotten if this is later in the presentation or not, is just to note that uh, each argument you make ideally should be following a different win strategy, but that's implying the debate has lots of options available to you. Some debates are just really narrow, it's not a huge amount to talk about. In that case, try to make it so that your arguments might be both aimed at the same win strategy, but have two different ways they're trying to prove the thing. So maybe, for example, if your win strategy in a debate about, uh, for example, uh, the, like just in general, like supporting the norm of the increasing medical prescription stimulants to combat ADHD. 
maybe you think that there's only really one way to win that debate, which is just kind of prove that giving more people with ADHD stimulants is good for them. Uh, but maybe there's two ways you want to do that. Maybe you might want to prove on one hand just why those stimulants actually help deal with ADHD, and so in that sense it's particularly useful. Or maybe the second way you would go about proving it is people want stimulants either way, and so we just prove that we're making it easier for them to access saves them a lot of trouble and makes them much safer, and that's probably good. So I would say both those arguments are trying to prove the same ultimate endpoint, but they have two very different vehicles of getting there. So that can also be a way that you structure your arguments in a way that's useful. Cool, that's a lot of general thoughts, but hopefully it gives you a good idea of understanding when you're in a debate and when you see a topic, what the kind of things you want to do and where you want to be kind of at the end of that half an hour of prep or however long the format is, is. Uh, this obviously all sounds really complicated, but I'll note it actually becomes relatively simple and the more debates you do, uh, the more clear this becomes. Just asking the question of like, hmm, are there things like, are there things I'm trying to make my arguments about things that actually are important, actually when we debate? It's a relatively simple question to ask. Uh, similarly, if we kind of go back through thinking about, have I proven a particular claim? Is it clear what the claim I'm making is actually about? Uh, do I have other ways I can win the debate beyond this one thing? Uh, am I comparing with the opposition? These are all quite simple questions to ask. So when you get feedback that you've missed one of these questions, remember that, and that's often a cue then in the next prep you do, in the next debate you do, to make sure you're addressing that thing. And over time, there are just less and less things that you keep forgetting. More and more of these things become intuitive. So in many ways, it's kind of a bash your head against the wall until eventually you're covering all the boxes. But it is a strategy that genuinely works quite well. Cool. Now that we've talked about what case writing is and how to do it well, Let's talk about how we'd actually do it in a debate, because obviously, this at the end of the day, we can understand theoretically how to do everything properly. We're not doing it prop well, though. Like, what well, matters? Cool. First thing I want to start with is topic selection, because in freebie free debating, uh, we always get, if you don't know this already, congrats, uh, we always get three different topics to choose from, and we get a grade one to three, a preference, one we're kind of neutral about, and a veto. So whatever the veto gets, which is third, we never have to debate that motion under any circumstance. It's way easier to write a good case if you're debating a favorable motion. One thing that you'll learn over time of debating, the more topics you debate, sometimes it's really fucking hard to write a case for a particular motion if a particular side. Maybe because it's really unbalanced, maybe because there's kind of nothing to say and it's just really boring. It can be many different reasons. Obviously, that's not something that's useful to complain about when you're in the debate, because bad luck, you've got to make the most of it. But it's useful to note in advance because you want to be looking for the easiest option you have available to, like the path of least resistance. It's no good trying to pick topics that are really hard for yourself if, you know, just for the sake of it, right? Like that's not proving anything, it's just like annoying. So, you should always try and select for the topics that can be most advantageous and most conducive to you and the rest of your team writing a good case. So, when you see that list of topics, like you'll get all three at the same time, Briefly ponder what each side might be running, so what, it, what might be some stuff your team says, what might be some stuff other teams say. Don't think about too deeply, literally just think about the most obvious stuff available to you. Because you only have five minutes to do your topic selection, that's three topics. If you think about it, that's like a minute of concentrated thought in each topic, and two minutes discussing with your teammates, and you ideally don't want to be using all five. So, uh, it's helpful to kind of think about that stuff. Uh, the second thing I'd suggest you think about is burdens or moving pieces within a motion. So what is each side being expected to do in the debate? What are the different components of this debate? Like, is this an actor debate? Are we, is it a regret debate? Are we going to need a counterfactual? All of those, is there fear? Like, all those kind of very basic questions can be helpful as well, because that often informs balance as well. Having done that, broadly I would suggest the following strategy. Firstly, decide what your veto is first. Because you might have to debate either of the other two, so it's easiest to start with what is the one I absolutely don't want to debate? Because that's the most important question to settle, because that's probably the one that's going to be way disproportionately harder for you to kind of debate than all the others. Then the criteria is just probably threefold. Firstly, the balance of the motion. So which one is actually just the best for your side? Uh, this seems fairly intuitively true. Pick the motions that are good for your team, bad for your team. Sometimes you'll read this wrong. That's okay, but this is why it's really important to listen to everyone on the team, so kind of collectively you can work out whether you're all thinking correctly. You might have the wrong of take, but maybe the other two of your teammates don't, and you discuss it, and you realize pretty quickly that you have come back and cooked it, and you can change that really, really easily. So, this is an important way. You're on a team for a reason. Getting more opinions is usually a good idea. Cool. The second thing then is level of knowledge. So if you think these two topics are relatively similar in terms of balance, which one does your team know more about? 
Sometimes it's fair to pick a topic where one of you might be super cracked at it to know that you're able to do the debate relatively well. Like if you're doing like, you see a sports round and then so no, you kind of all know a little bit about, let's say, Formula One, but someone knows a huge amount about Australian cricket. Maybe it's worth, if the topics are similarly balanced, pick the Australian cricket motion because you're likely to have a big asymmetry of knowledge of the other team and you can just take huge advantage of that during the debate compared to maybe you've all got some knowledge but like, not as much. Like you can trust your teammates to explain things to debate, and people having special interest of knowledge is actively something that's really helpful in debating and really good to catalyze things on. You'd be surprised how often I've used like cricket examples or like cricket related knowledge in debates I've done, if only because shockingly, if you follow cricket enough, it makes you really aware of what's going on in like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and all of that. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of the niche benefit of me as a white person, probably otherwise would know a huge amount of stuff about that. Otherwise, I know a little bit of stuff, and that can be helpful. Uh, the final thing is just the level of complexity. So, Motions that are more complex and have more easy pieces tend to be easier to screw up and make the case like just harder to execute because there might be more things you miss where other teams can punish you. So those two things you're not really sure. Pick the one that I would say is generally simpler and the one that you are more confident that you kind of can clearly understand and kind of do your best at. Because the more moving pieces there are, there are just more failure points. A motion with less failure points probably gives you more of a fairer chance, particularly against teams that are are either equal or worse than you. Maybe on a team where you're playing against a team that's much, much better, you might want to choose the complicated one to see if they cook something and then you don't, but obviously that's a bit of a punt to take, probably not something I'd recommend, but go to think about. So that's the first step. Get your topic selection right, case writing then becomes infinitely easier because you make things as easy for yourself as possible. Cool. The next thing is the first phase of prep, which maybe you've thought about before, maybe not, but it's the silent brainstorm. Wait, hang on. Uh, wait, where are you? Oh, sorry. Jess, we're in 213, right? Yes. Sorry, I was... I can go of forward. Forward. Um, Yeah, Eleanor and I think some other USU people are on the way. Could you, someone just be near the front to make work out? Cool, thanks. Cool, so silent brainstorm is the first component of prep. So after you've talked to the other team, you've done your topic selection, you know what motion you're gonna do, start with this. Maybe you're parked up and doing it somewhere, maybe you're walking to the room while you do this, doesn't really matter. But this is probably the single most important five, six, seven, eight minutes in the entirety of the round. Uh, for the very simple reason, this is where the majority of thoughts you and your other teammates are gonna have about the debate and where you're gonna think about a lot of the analysis. Generally speaking, your thoughts are not gonna deviate a huge amount from this because this is when you're most deeply and most critically thinking about the topic. Which is why, and I always have to remind my high school kids of this, it gets really annoying, but they none, none of them do it. Don't talk to each other during this point. For the extraordinarily simple reason, the three of you on your team are probably very different people. You've had different life experiences, you have different levels of knowledge about different things, different values, all of that kind of stuff. And that means you're all gonna come up with, even if you've all done lots of debating, perhaps similar, but ultimately somewhat different takes on the topic. And you want to maximize that spread because the more variety you have in how you see the topic, the more stuff you have to pull from to make the final product of the case way better. And so, Rather than talking to each other immediately, when you all start thinking the same way, you all start sharing your ideas early, and then it all becomes very homogenized, you want to maximize the chance to capture lots of different stuff in the debate. Uh, the only way I would break this is if someone just genuinely doesn't understand something about the topic at all, but obviously because you've had topic selection, this really shouldn't be a problem, like you should already all kind of know what the debate is about if it's not the topic you've been doing. If you didn't understand the topic at all, or someone didn't, you couldn't get explained to them, that was probably the one you should have been doing. Cool. All thoughts about the debate are useful, but I think there's a mistake in silent brainstorm that lots of newer debaters make. Because I think people thought you should do a silent brainstorm and think about the topic, and just a silent just kind of think of as many things as they can and just kind of bullet all, all down. There's a really big problem with that though, and that's it's incredibly inconsistent. Maybe sometimes you think about the motion the right way and get this, all this amazing stuff that you want to give, and it's really, really good. Maybe sometimes though, you just think a bunch of thoughts, but none of them are super useful, they're not particularly effective, and it really hurts the case that comes out after. That's the type of variation that particularly if you're in tournament settings, you absolutely can't have happen, just because it's gonna make it really hard for you to do well consistently. And one thing that I think lots of older, very skilled debaters do, but that people aren't necessarily taught explicitly, is part of the reason for that is because every time they see a topic, they have a plan and a specific way of breaking it down. So my biggest piece of advice to everyone, when you have a silent brainstorm that you're doing for a prep, have a think about what exactly you're going to say within that. And it can look like a couple of different things. I've got my personal checklist up here, what I do, and we'll break that down. This is not the only way of doing it. There's many different ways of doing it. But broadly, no matter how you do it, you're trying to tick roughly the same set of boxes in any world. So broadly, my approach in silent brainstorm would be something like this. 
The first thing I do is I will just analyze the wording of the motion. So I break down every key term. I will see, you can come into the room, you don't need to stand up there, there's plenty of chairs. Uh, I will see exactly what those things mean and what they imply in terms of burdens on the debate, anything like that. So I make sure before I do any other thing in debate, I understand how the motion works and I understand what it means. After that then, I'll think about the context. So this is like what parts, like it's kind of like why did someone bother setting this motion? So it's like what parts of the world are they thinking about where this debate might be particularly relevant? What's kind of happened in the past historically where this might be relevant? Uh, what might be the, what is the kind of main question of this debate? If it's not like a current affairs motion, what's the kind of central question of this debate that just the, whoever said this was intrigued by and wanted to explore? I think a useful way of breaking down topics is just remembering that like topics are set by people. People usually have reasons for doing things. It's very rare topics set randomly. Usually it was just someone was interested in something, wanted to feel thought about something, or just kind of thought it would be fun to debate. And so having that knowledge often makes it much easier to think about what topics are actually meant to be getting at in the first place. After that, the next thing I'll think about is the comparative. Very simply, make it as simple as possible. What is the biggest difference between the two sides of the debate. So what's the single thing that changes the affirmative world from the negative world? Importantly, sometimes this will just be a repeating of the topic. One world team is banning something, the other team is not. But sometimes it's much more ambiguous than that. It's which is the better strategy of achieving a particular kind of outcome or stuff like that. Making sure you know what the specific difference between the other team is, is really important. Both because understanding what the other team is running is necessary if you want to write a good case and beat whatever they're running but also because of the fact that it makes it much easier to make arguments that are delineated from things that their side will run. So make sure the argument's kind of exclusive to your side of debate in a way that's really useful. Then I'll just get into thinking about what are some of the win strategies that each team has. So firstly, start with what are the ways the opposition can win the debate? Those are the things that we're gonna to need to worry about, plan accordingly, make sure we can take out of debate. And then what are the ways we can win the debate? I like to start with the opposition first because often it can make it easier, especially in motions you're think are maybe more like, weighted towards the other side to come up with ideas for how you might want to win the debate, but also because I do actually think you need to do as much as you can in prep to support a tendency of trying to preempt and think about what the other team is doing. So it's good to prioritize thinking about the other team first, because that's the thing otherwise you might ignore, and that's probably not something that you want to do. Again, there's different ways of doing this, but I think broadly in terms of you want to analyze the motion, you want to be clear on the comparative, you want to kind of get an idea of what each team is running, those things don't really change across what you should be doing. Like I imagine every way anyone breaks down a topic would always be something like that. And so, if you have different ways of thinking about it, it's helpful. Generally, this is something that I would actually recommend. Like write it down on a piece of paper, just bring it with you into bed. Like I would just, after getting a bunch of feedback, it was like, this is how I'm gonna think about every topic I do. And then I would just go into debates and I just drew it as a checklist of all the things to think about. And once I've exhausted that, if I've still got time left, sure, then I'll think about a bunch of random stuff. Maybe I might want to list out stakeholders. Maybe I just want to kind of have some more whimsical thoughts about the debate. But I can do the structured thinking first and that ensures I have consistency in how I'm approaching the motions I'm debating. So if you can work out some kind of system like this, feel free to steal mine if you want. There's plenty of others you can use as well. Or do your own independent thinking. What are the weaknesses you tend to have on motions? You can very easily construct a space on what I know in topics I'm often really bad at thinking about what the comparative is, or I'm not very good at thinking about what the context of that particular debate's occurring is. If you know those are your weaknesses, prioritizing thinking about those things explicitly in brainstorm is a really good way of addressing those kinds of things. Cool. If you have zero ideas in brainstorm at all, not really the focus of this presentation, but I'll do it very briefly, because I can store this from another presentation I've already done. Uh, firstly, uh, think of just, ignore win strategies, just think of arguments you can think of first and then use that as a launching pad for counter arguments. So think of what might just be some of the stuff the opposition says. Cool, how can I make arguments that would defeat those things? Other ways, actively thinking about different areas of the topic. So maybe you didn't realize that you were focusing only on the effects of the topic in like the developed world, but you're only thinking about it in terms of democracies or only on the economy. But maybe you should have considered the developing world. Maybe you should have considered autocracies. Maybe you should consider the environment. Actively trying to broaden and shake yourself out of thinking about debates in a particular kind of way can be very helpful in getting more ideas. Similarly, doing really basic things. List all the groups that are just affected by a debate. Any institution, any individual, I don't care. Then, how are they impacted? Which ones are impacted in ways that are good for us? Which ones are impacted in ways that are bad for us? Which ones are the larger or more significant groups that we probably care more about? That's a really helpful way of breaking down a brainstorm, very simply, but getting you really, really good ideas and result. Even asking questions about this topic, is this fair, does this work, how people react? People often have intuitions for topics, but then will say they have no ideas about them. If you think, for example, topics are really bad idea, or you think it's a bit really messy, ask yourself why you think that. The answers you get are often gonna be really useful in the rest of the debate. 
finally, uh, think about how your team is going to win. Just think, if the judge was to give us the result, what would a judge probably have to believe? It's like, well, they'll probably have to believe that X thing is good. They'll probably have to believe it would work in Y way. And that can also kind of, working backwards can be a really helpful way of thinking about things. Cool. Once you've done that silent brainstorm, you go to the downloads, so you'll go, people call this different things, but it's all the same. Go around, you share all your ideas, and then once everyone has shared their ideas, you pull that together into what the actual case you're writing is. Uh, broadly speaking, my suggested end goal, at, by the time you finish your planning stage and you get into the writing of a speech, the first speech itself, there should be a couple of things you have in mind. Firstly, you should have some relatively cohesive self, or at least an idea of what are the things you're going to want to clarify in the debate and how it's going to work. You might not know exactly what those are yet, you might want to wait till you're actually writing the speech to do that, but you should have an idea of what things might need to be clarified. You can always add extra, or you can always be like, maybe we move this somewhere else, but you should know what it is, you should know how the debate's going to work. After that, a list of two to four arguments. So generally speaking, it depends on probably how dense the debate is and how much material there is, but also kind of the nature of you as a team. If you've got a really efficient first speaker and a second speaker who likes running substantive, then it probably makes sense. Give three arguments to first speaker, give one to second to kind of shift the debate in ways that are particularly fun. If your first speaker is really, really good at proving things, but not as efficient as working through claims, maybe you only might want to have two. So you just have two arguments first, and depending on whether you think that extra argument is useful, do you give one a second as well or not? So this is often dependent on how good the arguments you have but also keep in mind the constraints of your team and of you as an individual speaker and what you're actually capable of achieving. Um, importantly, when thinking about a list of arguments, again, they should be tailored towards the distinct win condition. Uh, principles are nice, but you don't need them. And I would note, if the principle is contingent on proving a practical thing, it's probably not worth writing as an argument. Only run principles if you think they're important, can be good for you in a debate, but also if they don't rely on other pieces of material in debate. For kind of the reasons I've already said, then it's just not very helpful. That said, if you think you have a good idea for a principle that's clever and smart and funny, run it. More people should run principles. They're really cool arguments. I'm a Phil student. I would like to see more people run principles and debates I judge. Cool. But two other things to note. Firstly, take the free kick arguments. Just because something is obvious doesn't mean you should run it, and in fact probably means you should absolutely whip the living shit out of it. It is usually better. There's a really obvious reason why it's a, your side of the topic is a good idea. Take that reason and shake the living daylights out of it and explain why that's fucking awesome. Because that's often just the easiest way for you to win the debate. And I think teams often like making life hard for themselves. But make sure you just take the stuff that's easy to do first. Like, run the arguments up front that are really easy to prove and obviously good benefits. And then you can start writing the things that are more fancy, more complicated. But you're probably less likely to win the debate on those anyway. So why prioritize them at the expense of the other thing? Finally, know when to drop or deprioritize weak material for time management purposes. So it's a really dense topic and you've got an enormous amount of ideas, like something really theoretical and it's a huge amount of stuff you could run or you're just being a very creative bunch and you just came up with a lot of reasons, know when it's worth just taking something out of the case because it's not quite as good, or being like, maybe we run this as a third argument if we have time, but if not, we're not going to bother. Uh, it's really important to not be too personally attached to the material that you've come up with in the debate. It's about the team. It doesn't matter if you're the older person the team. If someone younger has come up with ideas that are probably better and more likely to make you win, uh, be the bigger person just can see, yeah, those are better ideas. But also, you should want to win, and you should win to win with any set of ideas you've come up with side comes up with, not just the ideas that you individually come up with. That's like a big cringe. Cool. The last two things I want to note about this stage. Uh, make sure everyone contributes their ideas. Again, as I said earlier, you want to cast a wide net and brainstorm, have everyone thinking about things very diversely. That means you should make sure every person actually gets a chance to speak about it. So it's really important. One, everyone should be able to speak uninterrupted. Ask questions, you have them. But wait till someone's finished speaking. Two, everyone should discuss. If people have a thing of like, oh, I don't know if I want to go first or not, just go around individually in speaker order in a way that's kind of really simple, really easy to do. Uh, and then synthesize those ideas down together. So everyone should probably be writing everyone else's ideas down. Everyone should have a really clear understanding of what the ideas you've come up with, but also what everyone else has come up with. Because that way, you can look at your piece of paper. Everyone has the same amount of information from every speaker in the debate about all the stuff you've come up with, and that's going to make it much easier to synthesize down to an overall case that's very good. Uh, before you move on to the writing part, Everyone should be clear about what you're arguing and how you're going to win. That means you need to write out specifically, cool, our first argument will be this, our second argument will be this, our third will be this. We need to prove these two things, and broadly, these are the two ways we're going to try and win the debate. Awesome. That clarity generally makes everyone's life way, way easier. Other than that, though, this phase is really relatively simple. Just discuss things, think about the ideas that are good. Once everyone's kind of aired out their ideas, then think about, well, what do you want to actually use in the debate more broadly? Cool. Uh, the checklist for the finalized case, this is one that I stole from Matthew Toomey, he's quite a good debater, but uh, there's some good thoughts here, like, 
What's the comparison between the two teams? So what does each side of the debate look like? Uh, is there something that influences what those sides look like? Like, do you have fiat? So can you run a model to make that more specific? Or a counter model if you're on net that might change the debate a little bit? Be aware of those things that you're going to be. What do you need to prove? That's going to determine what arguments to make. What pieces of proof are necessary? So with the overall premises you're trying to prove, what are the sub-components of that, like the smaller pieces of analysis that you need to prove those things? Uh, and then finally, this is more on the writing part, but proving things, reasons, weigh them. That's generally very useful. It's a useful kind of checklist to think about, but uh, you don't need to memorize that or anything, just a way of thinking about it. Cool. Couple of brief notes before we wrap up. Firstly, the last part of prep, if you don't already know this, everyone together should be writing the first speaker speech together. If you don't want people to go off individually, uh, the first speaker speech is a collaborative effort among the whole team. That's a really simple reason. One, if you're second or third, most of your speech is going to be about rebuttal anyway. You should listen to what the other team says. You can't even write most of your speech till then. But also, you can just write it during the debate. But you need should be I'm like it's probably better to understand the first big speech in prep and then be able to write during the debate than have to stop writing because you need to listen and understand what your team uh, is writing. Like the idea of understanding what you're doing value is important. But also, I would just note that the first speaker speech is going to make a huge difference in the debate. A really strong, powerful first speech will make your life much easier. If, for example, there's lots of gaps in it, or you're inconsistent between speakers because you didn't know what the first speech was and you did something totally different, that's going to make your life much harder. And obviously, the more brain power you focus into that first speech, the better it's going to be. So everyone should be writing that together. It should be relatively straightforward. Broadly speaking, this then, having done all the macro stuff of prep, so we've thought about win conditions, thought about the general moving pieces of debate, this is where you fill that out with the kind of more specific sub-stuff that I was talking about earlier. Thinking about how you prove each premise, so coming up with reasons why things are true. Now, that's actually where most of the winning and losing close debates happen, right? Just how well do you prove things? And the answer is, well, one, if you're making sure you're proving the right things, that's helpful. But two, also making sure in this prep, everyone's contributing to that process, making it really, really powerful. Um, I have some stuff on this in a later slide, but I'm going to explain it now because it makes more sense here. Often, what can be helpful in preps is having a very clear dynamic within the team of how things work. So, yes, everyone can talk at the same time, but sometimes that makes life really difficult because it's just very inefficient, slow to move through. Remember, at this point, ideally, because you spend a good time talking about the case, you have at least 12 to 15 minutes, and that will change depending on team familiarity, how fast people can write things, how used you are to working each other. Like, I've got people I'll debate with when we write the case in like seven minutes, but obviously that doesn't always work. Like, depend I can't do that with every single person I'm debating with. But if you're assuming that this is a generally very good ballpark, uh, you want to still use that time relatively efficiently. Because writing like all your stuff and free arguments in that time, it's not a huge amount of time. So you want to make sure that you're using it efficiently and well. So sometimes it can be helpful to very dedicated roles within a prep. Particularly on ACES teams, what you often see is you'll have the pro just kind of write the case and everyone else will sit there and listen. I think that's helpful, but I'm generally a fan of slightly more collaborative strategies. I often think the most useful thing to do is have like primary and secondary case writers. So maybe the stronger person on the team when it comes to case writing is the primary case writer. They're directing the overall structure and the main ideas. But you're someone who's a secondary case writer and they'll do things, for example, like coming up with additional reasons for why particular claims are true or reminding you to add in particular pieces of analysis. Or maybe if there's an argument that they're a lot more confident being able to structure or really clearly understand, that person takes over for a while and starts writing that argument. And in general, serves accountability on the other person writing the case and reminding them what happens. And then assuming neither of those two people are the first speaker, maybe the first speaker then is just editing and tailoring those things accordingly uh, within their own speech, adding bits and pieces here and there as they kind of see fit. Yep? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, like, this is my first week of um, this year, so I was just wondering um, what structure are we following? Because I know that there are different structures, like the, um, the different terms. Um, so, like, sometimes you do, like, different styles of the Oh, terms. yeah. Broadly speaking, uh, Always important rule to remember on structure. What structure you use doesn't matter. Wrong question to be asking. The right question is just, is that structure something that's helping you be clear and be persuasive and prove ideas effectively? People have kind of commonly recite ideas about what structure is effective. And I can talk to you more about what that is later if you want. But the overall thing to remember is structure isn't like a rule to follow. It's a vehicle to making sure that your ideas are clearer and more consistent. So to the extent you're doing that, whatever structure you're using is fine. If your structure isn't feeling that purpose, then you need to change it. And that's why ultimately the thing that like if you're doing a thematic structure and you're doing your speech on issues, the question to ask isn't, well, I'm doing a thematic structure, so I'm doing it right, but it's like, what are those actually the things you need to be talking about in the debate? What are those actually the things that mattered? Were those actually, you know, important at all? Should you just be talking about other things entirely together? Uh, all that kind of stuff is probably what I think about. So yeah, structure's a vehicle to making our lives easier. It's not a end in and of itself.
Um, finally, uh, as I said, everyone should be writing speech together. Uh, and it also looks like if you're not first speaker, so actually you're second or third, it's usual to have a dot pointed out version of exactly what the first speaker speech is that you can refer to after our debate. So I'll like a one page summary and it'll be like title, claim one, a couple of dot points for the, each individual proof. And it might only be a couple words for each point, but it means at any point in the debate, I can remember every single thing that we had at first, and I can refer back to those things to make my analysis more persuasive uh, later in debates. Uh, the other thing is really simple, be flexible. Sometimes you just add things or come up with new ideas in this process. Just adapt accordingly. Cool. Uh, I realize I've been speaking for a very long time. I believe this is the last two slides. Well, basically almost done. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for like, watching on my hands. Cool. Some general tips and advice. Firstly, uh, prioritize within reason planning the case over extra time writing speeches. Uh, you can always add more detail because you've got a second and third speaker to pick up things that, for example, maybe you didn't have the right time to discuss or add in detail later. But if you've got a case that's not very good or it's wrong, that's way harder to fix in a debate than just a good case that is maybe a little bit underexplained. So obviously, there's a reasonable point here. You probably shouldn't be chatting all the way until you've got five minutes left to prep and then start writing your speech. But to the extent that the topic might be particularly complicated, for example, maybe it's worth spending like 20 minutes working out the case and then only 10 minutes writing, uh, and rather than, for example, just deciding to write a case earlier but being less confident in it. So keep in mind, a good case is more important than necessarily making sure it all comes out in the first speech, because that can be done later. Uh, obviously, that's a bit of a rough decision sometimes for first speakers to be in, but it's just kind of like, for the good of the team, it's probably the more effective strategy to adopt. Uh, the second thing is while writing, uh, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, challenge your own ideas. Do these intuitions seem correct? Have I actually proven this thing? Does this make sense? The answer to those questions is no. Uh, you should be honest with yourself if the answer is no, because you can fix it in prep, but it's much harder to fix after you've said it, or do backpedaling and have other speakers in the team, for example, have to pick up and carry that. So the more you kind of play devil's advocate with yourself, generally the better cases you're going to write. You don't necessarily have to do it out loud, you can do it kind of internally, or have another speaker on the team be like, have we actually proven this? Uh, and all those things can be helpful, people have different ways of doing it, as long as you're doing it, it's helpful. Um, and in general, the more predictive you are, the better the speech will be. So the more you can challenge your own ideas and make them more robust, the more you can figure out what the opposition is going to say and then adapt it accordingly, that means you have the most developed conception of the case that you do at the start, and that's really helpful. Because you could have like a version of the case that you're good, but you haven't at all considered what the other team's going to say, but if you consider what they'd say down the entire bench, and then have the version of your case that would exist at the end, then obviously by the actual end of the debate, it's going to be even stronger. Because cases do develop throughout the debate, start with the most developed conception that you can. I think it's really useful. Uh, and again, your team has more than one speech, remember that. Some things uh, need to be present in the first speech, but other stuff is more important. You can maybe move those things down. And particularly if you're not sure if a first speaker will be able to fit everything in their speech, it's often useful to, as a team, be clear what are the things that we're going to deprioritize and move down. Is that we're just going to spend less time fleshing out each individual sub-premise, so maybe instead of getting five mechanisms, we just get three? Or is it the case that this whole argument we can just move down to later in the day because it's not super helpful? So in general, good to keep that, find that. Cool. This is definitely the final slide. How to improve your case writing. So, to the extent you now have all of these ideas and you're wondering, well, how do I actually you know, use these things to get better? A uh, couple of things you can do here. Uh, the first thing is debate more. But I would note, I think debating more is kind of useless in a vacuum. I think there's a lot of people I've seen have the strategy of just, oh, the more debates I do, the better I'll be. This is not true and in general very unhelpful. People can often get very good not doing very lots of like a huge amount of debates or even taking large breaks from the circuit because they don't debate as much but what they'll do is they'll reflect about their debating and think about it far more in the same way that for any hobby the process of self-reflection self-improvement whether it's sport when thinking about technique or it's a handicraft and just assessing how you could have done things better for example video games when you're sitting on paper and you're working out like what's the best strategy for doing this and that's like it calculates more dps or whatever like all of those things it's the post-reflective process that is the most important to actually generating meaningful improvement. And certainly, not being the most well-read person in the world, certainly not doing the most debates in the world, uh, this is how I found that I've certainly been able, especially early on uh, when I started debating my first year, got a lot of improvement. So, if you're doing things like debating with pros, so someone who's much older than better case writing than you, see how they write questions, ask why they're doing the things they're doing, learn by observation. This applies to other teams you hit as well. If you hit a team that's really good and you get absolutely stomped, don't be like, wow, 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 we got stomped. Think about what you can learn from those kinds of things. Be like, oh, here are all the things they did well. We should have maybe considered this thing because that was actually really obvious. I'm not sure why I didn't think of that. That's always going to be really helpful. If you're doing with less experienced teammates and writing the case yourself, seek out feedback and identify what could be improved. Don't be willing to shy away from the responsibility of case writing. Take it on. Because in many ways, the only way you can get better is just writing more cases, making mistakes, and learning how to not make those mistakes again. And no matter how good of a debater someone is, 
No case is perfect. Like it always could have been better in one way or another. I've never seen a perfect case. I don't think it exists. So always be keeping in mind that process of improvement is really helpful. Uh, I don't know, even just watching the debate show helps. Like if you're at a tournament, you're watching like, the out rounds of a major and you didn't break, for example. So I'm just really gonna sit there and instead of just watching the debate and not really pay attention, think about the things teams are doing. Try and think about it as a judge. Uh, work out what teams are doing well and how, for example, you could learn from those things. Ah, uh, which reminds me, it's not on here. Judging more debates is often a good way of getting better because often you can judge debates that will be much better rooms than you'll be in relevant to like debate experience, especially if you're newer. It's very easy to like panel or train a very high quality room, but otherwise you would never get to see that debate. And there's a huge amount of learning to take from that if you're willing, ready to do so. Uh, the other thing is just read more. Like the more knowledge you have, the better cases you can write. And that's not like you should read an IR textbook and like memorize it front to back, but it's, you should understand how things in the world work. So don't understand necessarily everything you need to about economics, but understand like the basic concepts and how they actually interact and engage with the world. Understand what people care about and how people engage with each other. I think lots of good debates are actually just people who get how people work or get how, you know, things in society work. And that often means even though they don't have a huge amount of other knowledge, they're able to use that in ways that are really persuasive. Finally, uh, you can just do case practice, so you can write cases on your own, or as a team if you're prepping for a major. You can then either send that to people for feedback, there's many kind people who are willing to do that. Uh, Isaac has explicitly said, you can send Isaac uh, recordings of your speeches or case practice that you've done, and Isaac will be able to give feedback on it. So that's, you know, awesome service. Take advantage of the pros in your society. If you ask them, they're very often willing to give help. Brendan is willing to help, Rob is, I am, Jess is. Like there are plenty of, pe um, plenty of people aren't here as well, where if you harass them enough, maybe they'll respond and say that as well. <laughs> but I think the like, core takeaway is like, Asking people for help and asking people for feedback, whether they're a judge, just someone you know who's more experienced, it's a really crucial way of improving. Finally, just take the key takeaway. Feedback is really important. If you're not willing to take on feedback, you're never gonna know how to improve. That's probably not super helpful. The best debaters currently, in Australia and the one more broadly, are not the best because they were always the best. They are the best because they were not necessarily even willing to work harder than everyone else, but they were willing to acknowledge their own faults and work out what they needed to improve on and just improved in smarter ways than everyone else did. So if you can think about that as a takeaway thought, uh, I'm happy to take any questions from you. Otherwise, thank you very much. Sorry for taking so long. Woo! An experienced debate is tall. about a particular emotion probably are obvious or silly or not super valuable. But to be honest, um, you know, a lot of that, especially linguistic complexity, is often built on the foundation of like really simple observations about topics. Because when you think about it, like anytime you see debaters talk, it's like three new students in a room, right? So often the actual thing they're talking about, the actual argument they're trying to prove, is really, at the bottom, is built on a really simple observation. Like one that your mom and dad make about the topic, right? That's, that's the that level of simplicity. Right? But the implication of that, right, is it means that you don't really need, like, a serious, I don't know, like, world class debating education to, like, come up with, like, a good case that's pretty solid. Yeah? That can push a good team. You've just got to be willing to kind of take your simple observations seriously, to kind of interrogate them and extend them and build on them in a way that you end up with like a really pleasing argument that actually ends up doing a fair bit of work. So, like when you take a great presentation, loads of stuff in there, everything you said is correct, a thousand percent. But, I don't think they said correct, a thousand percent. But, I think that. The big thing going ahead to debate tonight, and also for those of you who are going to is when you get faced with emotion, and you have a set of gut reactions to emotion, right? Like, or a set of like, well, this seems weird, or like, surely this problem applies. It probably does, right? Your simple initial thought, or the first set of thoughts you have in the first 10 minutes of thinking of the topic, often are actually applicable in the debate. They're not, they're not, you shouldn't cast them aside. What requires often is just a bit of interrogation of them, a bit of thinking about them, and then it was like, they're like the timber you can construct larger claims on, larger, more sophisticated claims 
So in general, no matter what level of your debating experience you are, when you get faced with a topic, trusting your simple intuitions about the topic, and then being willing to build on them, will end up creating cases that will surprise you in their sophistication uh, and their persuasiveness.